On March 29th, uh, Energy Media published my column titled Rachel Notley Has No Energy Game, in which I argued that the former Alberta Premier led Canada in energy and climate policy from 2015 to 2019, but since the NDP's defeat has fallen behind in this area. She has graciously agreed to an interview, so welcome to the interview, Ms. Uh, Ms. Notley. That's good to be here. Well, look, uh, so let me summarize what I argued. Uh, in With the launch of the Climate Leadership Plan in late 2015, you were arguably, and I have in fact argued many times, that you became Cl uh, Canada's leader on climate policy. And that was followed during the uh, from 2015 to 2019 by many smart, effective energy policies for which I might add you receive very little credit. And those policies were generally, I think, generated by expert committees. I think of Andrew Leach's Climate uh, uh, Committee and the Energy Diversification Advisory Committee, OSAG, uh, whose recommendations you accepted and implemented. I thought that was a very smart policy process. Is that a fair description of your government's policies? I think, yeah, more or less. I mean, the way it, it started, uh, you know, we had going into the election in 2015, uh, being a very small caucus, we had done some high level commitments. And one of them, of course, was to develop uh, a climate change plan. And so uh, very soon after we got elected, actually, uh, I uh, we we had uh, some some folks from out of province uh, who uh, developed sort of a a draft um, work plan for Andrew and uh, draft terms of reference and uh, I recall spending quite a bit of time tinkering with that myself uh, on on many different levels and then ultimately going through an iterative process with Andrew and uh, and then he went off and started uh, putting together the work and of course. It, critical part of it, Markham, was, was uh, consultation uh, with, with a broad range of stakeholders, many of whom we didn't have access to before we were in government, including industry. And so Andrew was doing that. And then there was, of course, a parallel uh, set of conversations that were going on uh, between uh, environmental leaders and industry leaders uh, that had already been going on. We sort of wrapped the two together. Now, my impression as a journalist is that since 2019, you and your party have not made energy and climate a significant part of your criticism of the UCP government's policies. Is that a fair observation? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I think that uh, we have actually uh, challenged them on a number of, of fronts. Um, uh, but, you know, it is true that when you're in opposition, you're sort of following where they are going uh, to some degree. But I would argue that that we have, in fact, uh, gotten into um, a fair amount of uh, uh, critique and analysis of their energy program. The problem is, is that uh, we're, we're not starting from a conversation about where we were. We're in a completely different place now uh, where we're having to deal with something like a war room and the Allen inquiry and the decision to mine the tops of our mountains, you know, and, and Bigfoot. So it's no question that, that the, the quality of the conversation, I would argue, is, is, is not as helpful uh, as, as it would have been. But that's because we are, we've been chosen by Albertans at the, currently to serve as opposition. And so uh, we, to some degree, uh, our critique is, is driven by the somewhat unfortunate and superficial decisions that are being taken by our provincial government. Well, sure. I, and, and, and I would certainly agree with you that the, I mean, I made the point in the column, I think I said that Jason Kenney can't tie his shoelaces when it comes to energy and climate policy. So I am and, and, and very publicly not a fan of, of his energy and climate policies. Uh, having said that, there have been a lot of you know, in the last three years, there have been plenty of non-trivial energy and climate issues that uh, in which the uh, premier has jumped with both feet. And it's there that I, I still am of the opinion that maybe you could have, you and your caucus could have been a little more, you know, substantive. Uh, well, I guess, uh, uh, listen, I, I'm, I'm not, in I, I can't exactly uh, uh, debate sort of the, the vague sort of suggestion there. What I would say is here's where we are in terms of our climate and energy policy in the, from the perspective of being uh, in the um, uh, official opposition. Uh, there were high level principles that drove the work that we did when we uh, developed the CLP. 
And those principles, I would argue, are still very much in play. And, and they're pretty simple, but, they, but they're important. They include this, the fundamental point that you cannot pit the energy industry against the, the environmental uh, community and the uh, obligation to combat climate change. If you do that, you will lose on both. Uh, that we must uh, grapple very seriously with our obligation and responsibility to combat climate change. And we need to do that uh, even as an, a major non-renewable energy producer in the world as we are in Alberta. And that in doing that work, we absolutely cannot uh, fail to uh, always um, consider the interests of working people um, in terms of what the consequences are of decisions with respect to uh, combating climate change are on their day-to-day -day lives as well as their ability to earn a living. Um, and that finally, uh, climate change work shouldn't be seen necessarily as a burden. It should be seen as an opportunity and a tool for diversification. On that latter piece, um, we, uh, as much as we can, as, a, as an opposition, where of course, you know, we, we um, are in a different position in terms of the, the role and the work we're expected to do with the funds that we have at our disposal, uh, we have done what I would argue is uh, unprecedented work for an opposition caucus through our work on Alberta's future. And we have done uh, a, a tremendous amount of propositional work on uh, diversification, particularly within the uh, renewable and non-renewable energy sectors. And um, we, you know, we've done, uh, uh, I think now probably about 50 town halls. We've engaged with around 75,000 Albertans. We've, um, you know, you've, you've seen all the papers that we've put out, uh, but we've uh, been engaging in a way that uh, I is, I, I will tell you with my political experience, which is, really quite long in the tooth, you know, uh, I've been around the block for many times in terms of politics on both sides of the aisle. And this is unprecedented for any opposition party. So um, uh, what we know is that this is important because we also know that uh, even with the price of oil being where it is right now, under this government with its uh, uh, approach to these issues, we have fewer oil and gas jobs now than we had when Jason Kenney was elected. So um, their failure to address environmental concerns is not even protecting the jobs they claim they are. Um, and so that's where we're focused right now because that's where the people of Alberta are focused. Now, uh, back in 2015, 2016, you were uh, worked closely with the Liberal government in Ottawa. And uh, what, but then, a couple months ago, they released the, the emissions reduction plan, which is going to require considerable effort by the oil and gas sector to get their emissions down uh, by, by 2030. But you called it not a real plan, quote unquote, and quote unquote, a fantasy. I thought that was a little harsh. Can you explain why you, why you use those, those words? Well, first of all, let me let me contextualize those words, because the other things I said when I gave that statement was that we absolutely believe we have to shoot for those targets. We have to be very aggressive. We, we have an obligation to address climate change. And it was in that context that those comments were made. That being said, and it goes back to what I've already said, Markham, is that that you can't come out with these sort of um, aspirational targets scare the bejesus out of folks and then not pair it with a clear plan uh, to a uh, support industry in their uh, efforts to, to get down that path and B support the working people who rely on, on uh, the contribution to the economy of that industry. And, and what we saw when they came out uh, with that plan was that we were not part, we were not at the table. Perhaps the provincial government might've been at the table if they had a better relationship with the federal government. So I do think part of the problem is there, but nonetheless, we were not at that table. So we were not, uh, we were like every other member of the public looking at uh, a, question mark in terms of the support that would be provided to industry, as well as the support that would be provided to Alberta workers. And while I uh, am absolutely committed to uh, the province of Alberta, Alberta doing everything it can to responsibly reduce emissions both domestically as well as in our uh, uh, export, I will not 
as someone who wants to leave this province, stand by and allow for a massive wealth transfer uh, from Alberta to other parts of the country. Um, and, and so whatever plan is developed, and it should be collaboratively, and frankly should be made in Alberta, but you know, if you've got a provincial government that refuses to engage in this, it's obviously not gonna be, uh, but whatever plan is developed has to uh, uh, protect the interests of Albertans. Okay, well, there's a lot to unpack in, in, in your comments. And it, it was part of your response then the, the fact that the federal government has not released, yet released, a just transition strategy, which would Absolutely. have dealt with your issues around, you know, worker, uh, the impact on, on Alberta workers? Well, both, both. Uh, I mean, I don't really like the term just transition, really, but, but, but yeah, so support for working people as well as um, uh, support for the industry. Um, but, but yes, definitely the, the, what, what are you going to do um, uh, to ensure uh, that there are continue to be jobs and, and that we transition to long term uh, sustainable mortgage paying jobs. And, and it's a tough issue because, you know, even now, Mark, I'm, like even today, people are talking about how uh, the GDP in, in Alberta is exploding and isn't that great and Calgary's going to lead and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and yeah, it's not bad news. But um, as if you know, you've read Alberta's Future, uh, we're going back to the introductory piece to that Alberta's Future thing that, that, that I wrote two and a half years ago, which is that uh, growth that is measured solely in GDP that does not also measure uh, job creation and doesn't keep an eye on growing inequality is actually a very unhealthy healthy form of growth that will ultimately collapse on itself. And that seems to be the path that we're walking down here uh, in Alberta, that uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of money being made, but, but the structures for it to be shared amongst Albertans are not in place. Okay. Um, I've argued many times that the Alberta NDP's defeat in 2019 was caused at least in part by not having an energy narrative to counter Jason Kenney's energy narrative. Uh, will you have an effective energy and climate narrative for the next election? Well, we will certainly have one. I mean, I guess the voters will tell us if it's effective or not. Um, you know, listen, in, in 219, uh, what the UCP did very skillfully was they conflated our, uh, you know, nation leading efforts or maybe even continent leading efforts to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and to combat climate change with the internationally uh, induced recession that Alberta experienced with the drop in the price of oil. So they conflated it successfully. And that ultimately was their, their narrative. Um, I think now Albertans have seen that Jason Kenney has not secured any pipelines. He has not uh, grown jobs. Uh, and and uh, you know Alberta's economy throughout most of the term thus far has been one of the poorest uh, performing economies in the country. Uh, so he has essentially failed and he's lost the trust of voters. Our narrative is, is not going to be entirely dissimilar from where it was before, which is that Alberta is, an, is and always has been an energy leader. We are positive and optimistic and innovative, and we should be the ones who are able to uh, find the opportunities within the uh, obligations that uh, we have with respect to uh, combating climate change, uh, to innovate and diversify within our energy sector, both non-renewable and renewable. Um, and that uh, with uh, the price of carbon changing market dynamics, within that, there is an opportunity uh, to grow and diversify our economy and to reduce emissions. Um, and so, and, and, and that's sort of what some of what you've seen in Alberta's future uh, with our talk about hydrogen, hydrogen and geothermal and, and bitumen beyond combustion um, and, and our uh, commitment to, to get to net zero on our electricity by 2035. These are all things that uh, can um, work very effectively to grow the economy um, as well and to lead. Um, but if we don't get on that soon, then we're going to be left behind. I wanted to get return to your comment about uh, inadequate support for the for the industry. Now, the, there are plenty of, of uh, forecasters and reputable firms like Wood McKenzie who are saying that 
chronic underinvestment in oil and gas exploration and production will lead to high prices throughout the 2020s. Uh, it looks like this is going to be the last great oil boom that Alberta experiences. And the oil producers, particularly the big ones, have said very clearly, and you see it in their investor presentations, that they're taking their excess profits, their free cash flow, and giving it back to shareholders. So capital is going to do very well, labor not so great. Um, so what about the idea that, you know, a industry can pay for a lot of this itself, and it has still, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in environmental liabilities that we're not talking about that also need to be paid. And if it doesn't get done this decade, it may not get done. So how does that fit into your, your framework? Well, that's a, that's a really important question. And I, and I, uh, my, my focus is, is always going to be on Albertans and Alberta voters and, and, uh, our industry, uh, it's our industry. It's our product. It's our oil, our natural gas. Um, and we need to get our fair share from it. And, and so, uh, it is absolutely true that, that right now what's happening is, uh, that capital that I just talked about before in my previous comments is not, uh, being reinvested in Alberta in the way it should be, uh, in any one of the ways you talk about, it could be reinvested in reclamation. It could be reinvested in, in, uh, emissions reduction technology. It could be reinvested in just creating in, in, I guess, in exploration as well and, and more job creation, but, but ultimately it does need to be, uh, reinvested. And so uh, I think there is uh, that our industry uh, together with the federal government, with probably some support from the provincial government, we need to come together to do the work that will reduce our emissions in order to maintain a market uh, for a long term. And whether or not that market is driven by, you know, the kind of 120 dollar barrel oil we're seeing now because of what's going on internationally or whether we get down back down to to uh, more um, uh, reasonable oil prices that that still maintain the viability of the industry uh, if we are going to access the markets that continue to exist we need to do it with the product that is as environmentally responsible and and sustainable as possible and therefore there must be investment into that. And, and so it's uh, incumbent upon government to uh, set the signals uh, to industry to ensure that they do do that. And, and that's um, my view. And I think, obviously, you need to be talking to industry as well, you know, like it, it, it's an iterative process. Um, but right now, uh, our government's not looking at that. And we're missing an opportunity. And as you rightly say, um, you know, the, this high price horizon may not be as long as 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 we need, and it may be the last one. Uh, final question for you. When can Albertans expect to see the uh, Alberta futures process uh, completed? And, you know, some the, I, I don't know what your plans are for maybe a platform document or some kind of a summary document so that we know where the Alberta NDP stands on this issues. When might we see that? Um, you know, I think that uh, the Alberta's Future Project may actually be an ongoing project uh, because it is uh, designed to be iterative. It's designed to be propositional. It's designed to be responsive. Um, and and it's, uh, again, I, I wanted it to be set up in a way where we show our work and people see our mistakes. You know, like we're, we're going to throw out ideas because we're not experts on everything. Um, and some people who know more are going to come back at us and say, no, you actually got it wrong there. And we're going to say, huh, good point. Tell us why. And so, um, uh, um, you know, this work uh, that we are doing right now through Alberta's Future will inform um, uh, our platform ultimately. And, uh, you know, when when uh, my campaign team uh, comes up with their their timing around uh, platform release, uh, you'll get a notice <laughs> as a member of the media. <laughs> well, look, thank, thank you very much for this. Uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. No, thank you so much. It was good to talk with you.